So we're going to go back to Hebrews 11, talking about faith and what faith is. And a little bit of what faith is not, I suppose. But before we get too far afield in the details of the examples that are given, there's at least one more major theme that we got to look at regarding the definition of faith itself, which is found in the sixth verse of Hebrews 11, which says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. That is to say, to please God. For whoever comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And that's reading from the King James. The ESV is a little bit different. But without belief, it's impossible to please him. Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. This is a principle, Hebrews 11:6, and it's actually saying quite a few things that we're needing to understand fairly clearly. The fact is that you have two things that you have to believe. And without these things, if, if you don't believe both of these things, then you cannot please God and you cannot draw near to God. You know, whoever, you know, without, without belief, it's impossible to please him because whoever would draw near must believe that he exists and must believe that he will repay our effort. This is the meaning of it. And so when he says without faith, it's impossible because who would approach must believe that's telling you that our definition of faith is these things. God exists and God repays our effort. Those are in parallel in the text. And uh, keeping up with the times, I've provided a Venn diagram. <laughs> I think that actually they are useful. I'm kind of excited that they've become popular because I've actually always loved Venn diagrams. <laughs> I just figured out how to use them in PowerPoint. So I think you're gonna see more of them. But basically, these two elements of Hebrews 11, verse 6, I should leave that open. These two elements of Hebrews 11, verse 6 are he exists, God exists, and he rewards effort, you know. He's a rewarder of those who seek him. So on the one hand, you have this idea that God exists. Do we believe in God in the sense that we believe there is a God, that he does exist? You know, that's one thing. On the other hand, do we believe that good is rewarded, that good matters, the, that there, you know, basically that there's more to it? <laughs> On the one hand, um, a lot of people believe that God exists, but don't accept that good has its reward. Um, this is what we usually call the faith only or the faith alone crowd, salvation by faith alone, apart from works. Um, you know, no need to be baptized in the name of Christ, uh, you know, to start your Christian life. No need to follow through with the obedience. You know, once you've been saved, you can't be lost. All this doctrine. These are the people who believe that God exists, but they don't believe that he rewards those who seek him diligently because seeking him diligently would mean effort, work, obedience. And they really think that you don't need those. So they're over here on this side with God exists all by themselves without the reward. That's faith alone. That's error. On the other side, there was this, um, you know, under good has its reward or good is rewarded. Um, 
there was a movement some years ago now called Good Without God. And it was an atheist organization that wanted to prove that people could do good and charitable things without believing in God, that belief in God was not necessary to be able to do charity. Uh, that was that got some notoriety and some popularity for a time. But there's the idea that good is its own reward or has its reward or, or that, um, you know, the good that's happening or the benefit that is conferred is here and here only. It has no other ramifications. But they don't believe that God exists. So these are the polar extremes, actually. But in the middle, we have Hebrews 11.6, which is that if you want to please him and if you want to draw near to him, then you have to believe both that he exists and also that he rewards good deeds. He rewards seeking him. That's the truth there. It combines both his existence and our effort. Faith or trust or belief in God is constituted of these things, not just that he's there, but also that our efforts are what are is is what is our effort is rewarded our efforts are effective we can please him we can and must obey him so that's the big idea with hebrews 11:6 what's the big idea you know, that's the big idea but real bible faith is the combination of both not just one so now uh, looking at the verse a little bit more closely, I want to take just these words and make sure that we get the meaning of these. Um, it's comparing translations and some of this being my own research into the definitions behind these terms, but I don't want to belabor the point, just to make sure that we understand what Hebrews 11.6 is getting at here are the definitions and and the reason is because the phrase is actually very packed with meaning it's significant and and uh and heavy there's a lot of stuff in there especially in this idea that he rewards those who seek him first of all i would like to focus on seek my english standard version said seek my King, uh, New King James says, diligently seek. Um, you know, the Greek says, seek out, which is idiomatic for completely, like we would say, finish out, you know, um, or fill out a form. That's the meaning of seek out as in, Diligently seek. You know, keep seeking, keep knocking, keep asking, as Jesus said. So it's not just that we seek him, but we seek him out. We are going to keep looking. We're not going to be deterred. And you think perhaps of Acts 17, where Paul speaks in Athens and says that uh, he has set us up to find him. If we would search for him, if we would grope for him in the dark, as it were, and yet he's not far from each one of us. It's not too hard to find him, but it does take some effort. That's the idea. Not just to seek him, but to seek him out. You know, look, keep looking, keep at it. Do not be deterred. So you have to believe if you want to be pleasing to him, if if you want to draw near to him, you have to believe that what he's looking for is a diligent search, a persistent search. You will not be deterred from looking for him. You won't be kept away from him. The second thing here to focus on is that he rewards those who seek him. He rewards them. The reward here is uh, actually the, the word for wages or pay. For, you know, for a daily worker or whatever, for an hourly wage or something. 
he pays back effort or he hands out the pay. He compensates, gives wages, whatever you want to call it. But those are all the, the actual meaning of the word. It, it's, a, it's literally that idea of you know, payroll, that the worker gets their compensation, which is you know, fairly clear that we are working. <laughs> And that in some sense, we're working for spiritual pay. We're spiritually working for spiritual pay. There's a, you know, an implied agreement between us, uh, an understanding between us that God has terms for us, has things that he wants us to do, and we should be busy doing those things. And we expect that at the end of our day, which is our lives, that we will receive the due compensation, if you will. Which is not to say you're earning your salvation. We're not saying that. He's just getting at the idea that it is in kind, that he will pay if you will work. But if you will not work, clearly, he will not pay either. That's, that's all that's meant by it. Not that we earn something or we put God in our debt or whatever. Those are all nothing that I have ever said and nothing that the Bible teaches. That's a misunderstanding if that's what you're taking from it. What he's saying is that God pays back, that he pays for the work. There's an agreement there, a tit for tat, if you like it. And finally, I'd like to point out that what it literally says is that he becomes the payer of those who diligently seek him. The, the, the literal Greek underneath this is God becomes the payer of those who seek him out. And becomes is an interesting thing to say here because it's conveying this thought of a, a process over time, a change, a transformation. Is that because God changes? No, clearly not. What he's implying is that we, in our estimation, when we have faith, when we believe he exists, and uh, then he becomes, in our mind, the one who is going to pay us back. We're not getting our pay from anyone on earth. We're not, getting, we're not seeking to please men. We're seeking to please God. He's the one. That transformation is happening in our minds. We come to see him as the payer, or we come to trust him more and more. Or maybe you like the idea that it's just future. That we work now with the prospect of future payback, perhaps in the judgment or eternity or the end of life, whatever you want, however you want to describe that. That's okay too. But I think that the idea here with him becoming the one who hands out pay to those who seek him diligently is that in our minds, in our estimation, we come to see him this way. We come to understand that it pays to serve Jesus, as the song says. That it's worth serving God. Even if perhaps, you know, now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, to quote Peter. All right, so these are the things in Hebrews eleven six 6 and the, the density of it. Let's move to the next thing, which is, you know, it's a Hebrews 11 lesson, so let's look at some of the examples that are provided. The, the sixth verse says, He who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Well, Hebrews 11 shows us that he did reward those who diligently sought him. There's examples of this setup. 
And I picked the ones that I thought were the clearest ones of people doing something now that has a future payout, that you know has effort on their part and prolonged effort, effort over time, maybe even over a lifetime, uh, that has its reward from God whom they had to trust, they had to believe. So these are the examples I've chosen. Take them one at a time here. Hebrews 11, verse 7, the first example is Noah. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Remember, faith and belief are the same thing. The, the verb of faith is believe. Uh, faith is the noun, believe is the verb, or belief is the noun, believe is the verb, whatever you like. But these are the same. So when we say you must believe that he exists and must believe that he rewards effort by belief, Noah did these things, became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to belief, or which accords with belief, which is appropriate for those who have faith, however you want to look at that. But notice it is that faith or that trust, that belief that Noah was characterized by and by which we see he's warned about things not yet seen, events not yet seen. So that requires faith because we believe in things that are not seen. To believe that God exists, to believe that there are things out of our you know, earthly purview out of our uh, personal experience, that truth is outside of us in our experiences. It's an absolute thing, an objective thing. Also, because of this, he constructed an ark. And there was no reason to construct an ark if God didn't exist or if these um, efforts weren't going to pay off. Yep. No reason to have this large, very large box, which is what an ark is. It's a box. To have this very large box, waterproofed, ready to go in the middle of the continent, um, doesn't make a lot of sense unless there's going to be a flood. So he believed that his efforts would have their reward. And we are told he was about 500 when God appeared to him and said, the end is here. And he was about 600 when they entered the ark. So it took him some hundred years constructing the ark. And Peter talks about it in, second, um, in 1 Peter 3, uh, saying that God's patience waited during the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, that God was being patient with people to save them. Well, Noah believed not just that he existed, but also that he would reward the effort. And so he did what God said to do, build in this ark, even though they had never seen such a thing. But he believed that would have its reward, and indeed it did. It saved him and his household. Abraham is another example. The eighth verse records one thing that happened. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Again, we have that same belief. It's belief, not just that God exists, but also that God rewards effort. He obeyed when he was called, indicating that God was real, that God does exist. And he went out not knowing where he was going. How can you do this? Well, you can do this because God said to go there and you believe that God rewards your effort. It's the same as Noah building the ark after being warned about events as yet unseen, things that they'd never seen or, or thought about, circumstances that were not real at the time that it was spoken. But he believed it was going to be very real, and it was. And because he acted accordingly, he saved himself and his household could have saved others if they had repented, but they didn't. In Hebrews 11, 8, Abraham goes out not knowing where he's going because he trusts God, who said to him, go out. 
he believed that that would have its reward, that God's not going to leave him hanging. Whatever it is he's asking him to do, it's going to work out. He's going to stay with God. That takes faith. That takes trust. But it also takes effort. He's leaving his house. He's leaving his homeland, going away to some other country, you know, foreign tongue, foreign language, foreign food, different water supply, all that stuff. It wasn't easy. It was effort. Ninth and tenth verses about Abraham are another example, saying, By faith it was that he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What he's saying here is, Abraham accepted the temporary nature of this arrangement. He was willing to live in tents that were pitched in this land that was promised, not delivered. Promised, not delivered. When we say the land of promise, we don't mean, oh, it's full of promise. All I can see is potential, <laughs> which is another way of saying you've done nothing. <laughs> I see 100% potential in you. It's all potential because you haven't done anything yet. <laughs> Don't be fooled by the motivational speakers. But when it says the land of promise, it doesn't mean a land of full of potential. It means it's promised, it's not yet his. It's a foreign land that doesn't belong to him. And so he lives there in tents and he has the child of promise and the grandchild of promise. He lives there with them in tents, knowing that it's promised to them, but it's not theirs yet. Why was he content to dwell in temporary homes, tents? Because the 10th verse tells us he was waiting or looking for the city which has foundations as opposed to the tent which has only pegs. The city which has foundations is the city whose builder and maker is God. There is effort there is a lifetime. There are choices that have real world impact and have to be, you know, explained, rationalized to others who may wonder why you are doing this. Why he was doing this was he looked forward to the city of God. He knew that God had something much better than this. He believed God would reward that effort. Another example from Abraham is in the 17th through the 19th verses. By faith, Abraham, when tested, offered up Isaac. This Abraham, who had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it had been said, In Isaac your seed shall be reckoned or called. Concluding, Abraham concluding, that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So again, because he believed in God and because he believed God would reward the effort, he did offer up Isaac. And sometimes people will argue, well, he didn't offer Isaac. He was about to when God stopped the knife. Fair enough, God did stop the knife. That is the record. But Hebrews 11 was also written by God. And he said, Abraham offered him. For that matter, Genesis says, you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Genesis 20. So both of the accounts say that, in fact, he did offer Isaac. That is to say, God, who reads the heart, said it was a done deal. You can argue with him. I won't take it up with you. But the way that Abraham was able to do this was he thought even if Isaac should die, well, God could just raise him from the dead. No problem. No problem for God. He can do this. Rather than questioning what God wanted or why this was so hard or why it was so painful, wondering why he had to suffer or why it was, you know, took this much effort, complaining about it, he just went and did it because he trusted God and he figured God wasn't going to break his promise. That had to be the one through whom the line would come. He must be going to raise him, 
Must be God's going to raise him from the dead. Okay, no problem. That's trust. He trusted God. But that was effort too. And it was that effort, by the way, if you confer with James 2, that confirmed the belief that started in Genesis 16 and 17. He believed God and was considered righteous. But when he was tested, he was justified. He was justified by works, James 2 says, when he offered up Isaac. So he was considered to be righteous when he believed in God. That was good. But this proved, this justified, this finished it out, as James says. Not just that he exists, but also that he rewards those who diligently seek him. And that was quite an effort. Another example would be Joseph in Hebrews 11.22. This is another example of the fulfillment of, of Hebrews 11.6. In the 22nd verse, we have Joseph, by faith, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. This also is by faith. Not just that God exists, but also that he rewards effort. He mentioned the exodus of the children of Israel, which we know happened some 400 years later. He knew the time was coming and they would be leaving. They'd be going back to the promised land. Because of this, when he was dying, even though Egypt at that time was very big into mummies. Mummies was big business at that point in time in history. And indeed, he himself was, his, he was mummified. So his bones were still around when they left. They were able to take his intact body, his mummified body with them. But the preparations of the Egyptians were immaterial to him. Their gods were not the real gods. He knew who the real God was, and he said, this is not resurrection. The, this Egyptian religion, these, these pyramids, these texts about the afterlife journey and all the crazy things that are, in, that are scrawled and painted on the walls of those pyramids, the tombs of their leaders and kings. None of that mattered. This is what matters. You take me out of here. Told them to take him and bury him in the promised land, which they did. That takes effort too. <laughs> the Egyptians went to quite an effort to preserve the body and to preserve supplies for those bodies and instructions for those bodies to follow after their supposed resurrection in the Egyptian religion. And it was all for naught. Joseph effected a spiritual resurrection by having them take him out of his tomb and put him into the promised land. It's like us. We will be resurrected from the grave and taken to God's eternal heaven by faith. Moses is another example. 24 to 26 is one place. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the, the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ to be greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the reward. Also by faith, Moses chose not to be considered an Egyptian, not to take hold of the trappings of Egyptian royalty, which would have been his. The daughter of Pharaoh adopted him. He was Pharaoh's son, if you will. But no, he chose to be identified with God's people instead. How did he do it? It says he did so because he was looking to the reward. Just like Joseph, he knew there was nothing to the religion of Egypt. That the real God is really served in this way. Was it an effort? I'd say so. <laughs> if you read Exodus, the things that he had to endure, the alienation from his family, the alienation from his nation, from the promises of this world's 
uh, trappings and royalty. Yeah, it was effort. And he stayed the course for a very long time. And the 27th verse, finally, Moses says, by faith, he for, it says, by faith, Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He left Egypt. Egypt was reasonably comfortable, you know, except for, you know, the persecution. But he himself wasn't being persecuted. He was the son of Pharaoh. God's people were being persecuted. He wasn't until he started identifying with God's people. Then he started to suffer. But it was by faith that he left Egypt, going somewhere he had never seen. He hadn't been to the promised land before. He hadn't, you know, crossed the Red Sea, gone off that way. This is all by faith. But his endurance, you know, his ability to do so came from this, that it was as though he could see the invisible one, as though he could see God. We know that he couldn't see God with his eyes. Nobody sees God with their eyes, but by faith's eye, you can see him. You know that he's real. You know that he's there. You know that he rewards effort. There is a reason to live the Christian life. There's a reason to make the right choices. God will repay you. All right. In closing, let's look at repentance in Hebrews 11. And the reason I would call that uh, a conclusion on this lesson is because repentance, if you think about it, you know, if you're changing your heart, you in your heart realize that God is right and I am wrong. I have not been doing what God wants me to do. I need to be right with him. Your heart is changed and you've decided that you're going to live for him from now on. You're going to do what it takes to be reconciled to him. That means you believe that he exists and you believe that he rewards those who seek him. You're showing that belief, the belief, Hebrews eleven six 6, that is required to be pleasing to him and to draw near to him. You're showing that belief when you repent and obey him. Hebrews 11, 29, the people by faith pass through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. They did not have faith. The same water killed the Egyptians, but it saved the Israelites because it was mixed with faith. As Peter said in 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21, not the removal of filth from the flesh, but the appeal to God for a good conscience. There's a spiritual aspect to baptism. And 1 Corinthians 10 tells you that the baptism, or that the people were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. But you see what's happening there? Despite their past in Egypt and whatever compromises they used to make to be good with Egypt, to get along in the world, whatever doubts they had about Moses, whom at first they pushed away, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Those were in the past, and they left them in the past, and they looked ahead instead. And when they looked ahead to what God was promising and believed God, they took action to save themselves by obeying him. They went into that Red Sea. The same is true in Hebrews 11.31 with Rahab, whom the scripture tells you plainly is a prostitute. The prostitute Rahab did not perish by faith. She did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. She used to be, you know, the prostitute. That did not continue after the conquest of Jericho. She joined the people. But despite her past, 
She also looked ahead and knew that the Lord would be victorious and that the Lord would give them the land and that she needed to be on the Lord's side. And she took actions, also unafraid of the king. You know, there are very many parallels, actually. But she also took actions to save herself by obeying God, whose will was going to be done, whether she fought it or she went along. She knew that his will was going to be done, was going to be done and so she took action to save herself. And it was by faith that she did not perish along with those who were disobedient or those who did not believe. Those are actually the same word in Greek. Further proof that belief and obedience in the eyes of the Holy Spirit are the same thing. But these are repentance, and they show that people believed there was a promise, there was a reason to do right. And I refer you back to Hebrews 10, 22, which simply says, let us draw near. See, whoever would draw near must believe he exists, and he rewards those who seek him, Hebrews eleven six. 6. But here, Hebrews 10, 22 encourages us, let us draw near. with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. It's just what we were saying. We can draw near to God with a true heart and full assurance of faith when we ourselves have that conscience, we have that repentance and we seek him through baptism in water in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. We can become a child of God. We'll be brought near. Those who were far off were brought near. And that full assurance of faith, you believe God, you really believe him, then live for him. Become his child. Why not obey him today? We have water prepared here that you might be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins. We're ready to help you to obey him. Are you a Christian today who has not lived right? Repent. Go back in faith. Understand that the effort will have its reward. I think we get tired, perhaps. We forget that this is just a short time. It doesn't seem like a short time sometimes especially when it's painful. It seems like a very long time. And that's fair. But we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. He was tempted in every way as we have. We were. He has suffered everything we have suffered. He's felt all the pain, all the loss, all the rejection. Everything that we feel, everything we suffer, he's done it. He knows. And he's there in the Father's bosom standing up for us. Take advantage of his love and his mercy and grace. And be buried in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. Take advantage of his love and his grace for you, Christian friend, and repent and come back to him in prayers. We'll be glad to pray with you and for you. Either way, if you let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing.